Good evening. Over the past few weeks, we've had a couple of baptisms, some inside the church, inside our church, and some outside our church. So this week, I've decided to theme my songs on a brief sort of passage of how Christian life will look like. Obviously, it's very vague because I've only got a couple of songs. I think it's important for new and old Christians alike to realise that baptism isn't the final step towards redemption. It's the first step in a Christian journey. Baptism is you turning over a new leaf to then be redeemed in Christ. <clears throat> and every day, in the words of the first song, which is song number 722, we must let the beauty of Jesus be seen in us. And the passage that this song is based on is Psalm 110, verse 3, which reads, Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. And the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. Would you please stand for the first song? <clears throat> Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me, all his wonderful passion and purity. Oh, my the of Jesus be seen in me. When somebody has been so kind to me, love spoken and pierces you through and Think how he was beguiled, spat upon and reviled. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. From the dawn of the morning to close of day, in example and in all you say, lay your gifts at his feet, ever strive to keep sweet, let the beauty of Jesus be seen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time uh, that we have tonight to uh, worship your name, uh, to hear from your word. Father, we pray that you'll uh, bless every head that's uh, here tonight and pray to be with the brothers, uh, bringing us the messages. Father, we uh, at this time we thank you our sister Emma and her family uh, with the terrible news that they had uh, yesterday. Uh, we pray that you'll be with them through this period uh, and pray for comfort for them. Father, we pray for uh, everyone who's not here tonight that you'll watch over them and return them to the fold again. Uh, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the love that brought him to this earth uh, to die on that cross and for the hope that he gives us of eternal life. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. The next sort of highlight in a Christian life that I've decided to base my next song choice upon is the fact that we can go into every single day knowing that whatever happens, whether we get fired, whether even if we die, we have assurance that we know where we're going to end up. So the next song is number 480, which is Blessed Assurance. And the uh, passage that this is based upon is 1 John 5, verse 11, which reads, And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. <clears throat> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of 
This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. At rest, I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Hello. Turn your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> As 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'll be reading from verse 23 to 28. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's uh, body. In my line of work, preparation is very important. It's very crucial. If you go into a service, whether it be breakfast, lunch, afternoon tea, dinner, if you are not prepared, you're in big trouble. Not just for your boss, not just for your colleagues, but also for your customers. Because maybe they want this, but because you're not prepared, you don't, you're not able to deliver the customer's needs. Also, if you think of a, a boy, on his first date or a girl on their first on their first date you know preparation is quite important you know that you can imagine that girl standing in front of that mirror putting makeup on brushing their hair or whatever whatever it is that little girls do to yeah to 
prepare themselves for that special moment for them. The same for the boy. Preparation is very important. Not just those examples that are mentioned, but in every aspect of life. Exams that you mentioned, Adam, this morning. If you're not prepared, you're going to go in that exam hall and you're in big trouble if you're not prepared. And then in your class, runners, they, um, bodybuilders, and so on and so forth, the preparation that they have taken to try to achieve their goals is very important. What we are about to do to remember Christ, that also take preparations. And that also is very crucial and very important. Because Christ died for us, and he asked us to remember him every first day of the week. Remember the body that was hanging on the cross, and remember that blood that was shed on the cross. Let's give thanks now as we remember Christ. Father God in heaven, we are grateful again for this another opportunity that we can come here to remember your son, Jesus Christ. Father, at this moment, we pause and we <laughs> prepare ourselves. We focus on the, on the body of your son that was hung on the cross. Father, bless this bread as it symbolizes the body. Be with Brian and whoever else is partaking tonight. Bless him and bless those who cannot partake it tonight. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray this thing for the fruit of the way. Father, as we continue to remember your son, Jesus Christ, we now think of the blood that was shed on the cross on our behalf. The blood that would enable us one day to be with you, Father. Help us not to take it for granted. Help us to always remember its, its significance in our own lives. Father, bless this cup and bless those who cannot partake it tonight. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. I'll now hand you back to Camden. <clears throat> Thank you for your thoughts, Pablo. <clears throat> the next sort of highlight in a Christian journey, I guess, is, well, to phrase it better, it's not always going to be smooth sailing as a Christian. Our faith is going to be tested. In our teen Bible class on Sunday mornings, uh, a couple of months ago, I think it was, we did a study with Adam, and the main verse it was based on, which I can't remember, was when you go through the valley of Baca, which is the valley of weeping. When, not if. But we as Christians have something that keeps us uplifted and will help us continue. And in the words of our next song, we have an anchor, which is song number 467. And the passage that this is based on is Hebrews 6, verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which enters, enters the presence behind the veil. Will you stand for this one, please? <laughs> Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or remain? fast and sure while the billows Fast into the wrong bridge on and here in the Savior's love, it is safely moved 
thrill the storm with sand. Ward is well secured by the Savior's hand. And the cables pass from his heart to mine. Can defy the blast whose strength divine. We have an anchor that keeps us Stand the Christ and sure while the heavens Fast him to the rock which found on you. When I rise behold through the gathering night, when the city of God. I go past by the heavenly shore, where the storms all pass forever. We have an anchor that gives us soul, stand by sensual and wild as we are. Pass into the rock, which shall know. In the Savior's Hello? I'm so thrilled to see Cameron standing here and doing all these. David, you are blessed. Your kids are so wonderful. And this reminds me of what Paul told Timothy. I know you are like that because of the handover from your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Lois. And now you are also showing the same character. So Dick, you have done a fine job to raise your grandchildren. To the extent that they can stand here and also preach to you. And I must say, Kambano Church, God has blessed us because we have all these young men to you know, raise the hopes of the future of this congregation high. Because we know that if the old tents are removed, the new ones will be replaced. And give me that kind of hope that this congregation has a brighter future. So let's continue to encourage these young people who are now holding the baton. We know they will fight a good fight, as Paul told Timothy. I think Tuesday or so, Graham tested me to say, Paul, well, what is the topic of, of, of your lesson? In fact, I had not prepared anything. So I said, I will get back to you. And then I test him to say that uh, my topic is, uh, who are you? And then Graham tells back to say, I know who I am. <laughs> I know that's Graham. <laughs> well, so tonight, as was announced this morning, um, it's kind of a question I want us to answer ourselves. The churches of Christ, who are these people? Who are you? Have you been asked this question before, where probably at work or at school or in your 
locality or your neighbors ask you, which church do you go to? It's a church of Christ. And you see their faces kind of, they don't really know what you're talking about. Have you encountered that before? And they ask you, Church of Christ, who are these people? They know the Catholics, right? They know Jehovah Witnesses. The Mormons are at their gate all the time. But the Church of Christ, I've never heard of it before. We've had this all the time. So tonight, I want us to ask this question. Who are we? Who are we? If we read Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 to 46, our Lord Jesus Christ, before he set up his kingdom and preaching to people, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. He didn't end there. And then he continues saying that again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of the fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of a great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. What is special about these hidden treasure? And what is special about these pearls? Now, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like this hidden treasure. The question is, what is the kingdom of heaven? According to the Bible, Jesus was talking about his church he was going to set up and I wanted the people to know how precious this kingdom or this church is going to be. <coughs> and that is why he painted that beautiful picture so that people or his disciples will know what he intend to plant on this earth. And those who knew it and valued the church, such as this hidden treasure and these, you know, fine pearl, sold all they had to own that church. And here Jesus is you no know, painting this picture to you and I so that we know how precious the kingdom is going to set up or he was going to set up for the church is to Jesus himself. Sometimes people, I, I, I read or the story that I heard about you know, Africa and some countries before the white man went to Africa, there were some countries that, you know, there they, 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 they were so many gold around and people did not know the use of them. And sometimes the kids, you know, got this gold and tried to shoot bears until. The white man went there, and then he, he knew the value of this. These people have this precious mirror, but they didn't know the use of it. And when they got to know the use of it, now you go there and you can't find it. In the same way, Jesus is telling you this picture that the church. Those people who knew the importance, the value, and how precious it is, sold everything they had so that they can own it. 
the church of Christ, who are these people? And what is the church to you? The next question is, why are you a member of this body at all? There are so many churches around. You know it. And sometimes even people know these churches than we do. Why did you choose to come here? The question is, are you a member of this body because you have been obliged to be part of these people or this group called the Church of Christ because you're born into it or because your parents, this is the, the church, so you have no choice. You have to also be here or a friend invited you to come and you don't know exactly what this church is. Or oh, you study with somebody and then you came here. You may have been here with a different reason, but now probably if you don't know how precious the church is. Jesus is giving you the picture. Something that, you know, somebody find and trying to hide it and went to, you know, sell everything that he had so that he can own it. The picture Jesus is painting here is telling you how precious this is. So if you are here, whether you are here because this is your parents' church or you're born into this congregation, the congregation as the Church of Christ, I mean, this may be the reason why you are here. But now you should know why you still remain as a member of this kingdom called the church. You see, in I think December 81, if I can recall, was the first time somebody invited me to the Church of Christ. Anyway, um, a neighbor of mine. <coughs> that time I was an, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church member. I was young that time. It was about 14 years. And he said, or oh, he want to invite me to church, but he promised me something. He said, well, I'll get you lunch, so let's go. Honestly speaking, I followed him because of the lunch I was going to get. So we went there, we got this lunch, and it was so nice. So I decided that next Sunday I'll follow him so that I can get this land. And in fact, we went to the church and I saw that the service and what I know from the Seventh-day Adventists is quite different. So I think the, the next Sunday was, it was getting to Christmas time Things were so busy uh, in Ghana at that time. And I followed this man to the Church of Christ again. And I remember I went in there and the, it was lost of a time. I will never forget this. And uh, they passed in the place and they came to me. And then I took one of the bread. 
And he held my hand like that and said, no, you've not been baptized, so you cannot take it. And I drop it. So when the church finished, we go and I said, why, why couldn't I take it? The, the, the food is for everybody. And then he said, yes, this is a special meal that God, uh, Christ, won his followers to you to remember him. And those who are in that, that body, and before you can be a member, you need to be baptized. So he started, you know, teaching me a lot of things that I never, you know, no. And then I started studying with him. Now, so many things started to come out. Then I saw the Church of Christ in a different picture as compared to where I came from. So, the 3rd of January 1982 was the day I baptized. When I went in there and then I just confessed and said, well, I want to be a member of this church. But honestly speaking, I did not know much about it. And as Cameron just said, baptism is just the beginning of your journey. So Emma, what you did was just, is Emma here tonight? Oh, little sister, you are welcome again. But you have just begun the Christian journey. Even though you've started this journey, you still have to know what the church of Christ is. Why you are here. If somebody asks you, Emma, why did you decide to go to this church and not the other churches? What are you going to say? But then Jesus has already given the, the picture to see how beautiful his kingdom is going to be. Now we need to know the role the church play in our salvation. You see, I do Facebook program, people just ask questions. And sometimes I remember you know, I, I was teaching the church and the, some of the questions that came out, uh, some people think that, oh, as for the church, it doesn't matter. It has no, you know, it doesn't have any part to play in your salvation. But then, that is what some people think do. But is that how you also think that the church of Christ has no role to play in your salvation? Because the church is the bride of Christ. And as you cannot separate me from Felicia, so you cannot separate Christ from his church. And if you say that, as for Jesus, yes, I will accept him. But as for the church, it has nothing to do with me. I mean, how can you accept Paul and you cannot accept Felicia? Say, oh, as for Paul, I accept him. But Felicia, I, has no, I have nothing to do with it. So Christ and the church are inseparable. So sometimes... Uh, you know, when you are doing all these studies, the kind of question people ask, um, you can see that they don't have. And sometimes I tell them, yes, if you think your church, where you belong to, cannot save you, I understand. Because you, are, you belong to, you know, human institution that has nothing to do with our salvation. But a church, I'm talking about what the church that is in Bible. The church of the Bible has everything to do with my salvation. So as soon as you are born into this kingdom, the journey has begun. And if you step away from that body, it means you are in danger. 
sometimes it pains me that there were some, you know, people that uh, used to be here, but now they are no more with us. I'm not quite sure if my brothers and sisters that have left did understand why they were members of the lost body. And if they didn't know if the church, you know, did, if they didn't know that uh, if the church has any bearing or relationship with their salvation at all, I don't think they do. Other than that, they will not leave the church. Knowing who you are is very, very important. Getting to know your identity is very important. And sometimes it becomes so disturbing if one cannot identify who he is. The question is, would there be a situation where somebody cannot identify himself or herself? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you consider people living with dementia. No, I work a lot with people living with dementia. And I know how sometimes they struggle to identify who they are. Sometimes you ask somebody your name and you have no clue. You are asking him or her about the name and he is telling you a different story. Because of the nature of the illness, they cannot even remember their name. So it becomes so disturbing if you don't know who you are. Now, let me tell you this secret. Felicia even doesn't know. So are my boys, they don't know. This is the first time. So when I, we get home, don't ask me so many questions. When I was a toddler, I say between three years and four, or between three and four, I can't remember exactly, but I know I was less than five. I got lost in my own community. And um, I just followed some kids too. They were going to dump refuse in the refuse site. And I don't know, I was just following them. And I don't know which way they, they went. So I got lost. And I started crying. So somebody saw me and asked me, What's your name? I was able to mention my name. Where do you live? I have no clue. Three, four years. I don't know what you're talking about. Who is your mother? My mother is mom. As for mom, I know. Her name is mom. So, that man was so disturbed, he didn't know what to do. This is a wee boy crying, and he doesn't know where this boy came from. So the next thing that came to him is, let me take this boy to police station. Not knowing where I got lost, it's so close to my house, but I didn't know. So this guy took me to the police, and the police also started to question me. I was able to, the only thing I was able to say is my name. The rest, I have no clue. What is your mother's name? Mom. Your father's name? Dad. That's me. Because I couldn't identify who I am or who I was at that time, because I couldn't, you know, give them any reasonable identification, police had it very tough to find my roots. So if what I'm trying to say is, if you are a member of the Church of Christ, you should be able to know why you are a member and what the church is. It's so important. Now, knowing these things will help you and give you this beautiful picture that Christ is painting here. And that will also help you to grow you or 
uh, make you uh, help you to get a firm stand in the church. Those who do not, uh, uh, do not know this, any little thing, just push them away because they don't know the value of the church. They don't know why they are members of the church. So it's better you know your identity before you are sent to police station and you cannot mention your mom's name. <laughs> The Church of Christ, who are these people, and what identifies? Now, back to the Old Testament. If we read Jonah chapter 1, verse 8, Jonah was asked to identify himself when he landed on a ship that was heading towards Tarsus. Whilst he was trying to run away from responsibility, he was run, run away from God because God asked him to do something and he didn't want to do it. So he was running away and uh, he just found himself in somebody's ship. And God started to disturb the sea. So the sea became rough. There was a wee bit of, you know, turbulence in the sea, on the sea there. So the guys on the ship, found uh, uh, what is his name, Mr. Jonah, lying fast asleep. They got hold of him and asked him, hey, who are you? Now, tell us, whose account is, has this evil come upon us? Now, they thought that this kind of turbulence that was going on and how rough the sea was, something is happening. And they found Jonah to be, you know, the odd among the even. <clears throat> so they started to question him. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? Where do you, where do you come from? I promise David, uh, who did I promise that I have to get him a Scottish shot in this one? Oh, it's you. Don't remember. Where do you come from? And which country is you? And what people are you? So the people wanted to find out, you know, uh, who Jonah really was. And he started to answer them. But the question is, if you don't know your identity, I remember not long ago, Paulo gave us a lesson on that. So important. I'm just trying to connect this to how first you should know the church that you've been born into born through baptism. You should know. I believe this question they asked helped them to find out who Jonah really was. And knowing your identity is very essential in order, you know, not to land yourself as I landed myself in the police station as a kid. One thing that God of heaven has done is that all the people, about 8 billion people on this planet, God has given us a unique ident identification, everybody. Now, this science has you know, over the years have proven this to be true. That is, each individual human has a unique identification code in his or her genes. And this is only for you. And this is what we call the DNA. <coughs> DNA is a code that identifies individual human who you are. And this is what is helping police to track the bad people. 
because God has identified him. Not even two identical twins will have the same code in their DNAs. So sometimes when I hear people saying that uh, there's no, I mean, they don't believe the designs in creation because if they believe that, then there must be a designer and they don't, ask, they don't want to accept that it's God who designed us. How come that of all these 8 billion people, we all have different codes and there's no two person will have the same. It tells you how God himself has identified everyone. According to Jesus, God knows the number of hair on our head. So it tells us how personally God knows each one of us. It's so important. And it's true because God told Jeremiah, I think Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, that before you were born, I knew you. So you can see that God knows you. In fact, your DNA is something special that God knows is given to you, you alone. And nobody can share with you. Now, that is the extent that God knows us. We are, everyone is special to him. Now, we should know the church in that way. You see, before the COVID, I think about three years ago, there were many Afro-Americans that went to her, uh, Ghana for a festival called the Year of Return. And this was initiated by the Ghanaian government trying to unite the, those who were taken away through slave trades. Now, though it has been over 500 years since the ancestors were forcibly taken by these slave masters to the land of no return, but do you know that some of them through the DNA trains were able to connect to the ancestral homes over 500 years? They were able to do that. And it tells you that these identification marks that God has given to each and every one is so special, so unique, and it helps us to trace our roots. The question I asked earlier on is, the churches of Christ, who are these people and what identify us? When I became a Christian, you know, in 1982, that's when I baptized, the, first, the third of uh, Sunday, third of January. One thing they started, you know, helping us, the new converts, is to teach us how we can also win souls because we're told us. This is the lost body and people have to know it. So we're doing this house to house evangelism. But anywhere we went to do the house to house, as soon as you were there, they start to ask you, are you the Jehovah witnesses? Because they knew that these people were there, you know, they do that house to house. And apart from that, they don't see any other church. They say, no, we're Church of Christ. And then the next question is, Church of Christ, who are these people? 
uh, we, we know Methodists, we know Catholics, we know what, we've not heard of you, the Church of Christ. And when I was preparing this lesson, this just come to my mind. So do people really know who we are? If Christ is painting this picture to let the world know how precious his church, his kingdom is, is that how people see it? Do they really know who we are? And then they want to know what identify us. That's why they are asking you. You see, we have some kind of religious organization that have some things that identify them. Let's take Muslims, for example. You see a Muslim, at once you know he's a Muslim, even before you even start to speak. Are you with me? Is that correct? Yes. What identifies that person that you think is a Muslim? What identifies him? Clothing. That is true. The way they dress identifies them. You see somebody you say, oh, this person is a Catholic. What made you think he's a Catholic? What identifies a person that you can say is a Catholic? They're crucifix, right? Everybody is hanging in the air. So there are some religious bodies that have some kind of physical identifications. Then you can say, if you see somebody with watchtower, nobody tells you that he is Of Christ, what identify you? So, this lesson <laughs> is kind of introduction. I finished my introduction, but the the question I want to put in your mind just now is: know your roots. It's very very important. Know why you are a member of the Church of Christ. Start. I know we do, but let this be a challenge to you. Start to study about the church from prophecy to when the church was established and the history. And I'm, I'm happy that Adam and Graham, they have started us going through the book of us because the book of us is the books that gives the history of the church then you see that the church of Christ is not as any other church as you may think, because there are people who think that the church of Christ is the same as any other church. I'm saying this because I know some brothers, when we were in East Cobride, they left the church, and then they've been to other denominational churches. If you ask them, oh, uh, it's... I think I spoke to, uh, uh, there was a meeting in East Coast, right? One of them came there, or just chatting with him. I don't want to mention the name because most of you know him. And I said, oh, well, it's it, it, the same thing. We do the same thing as, I mean, is it, it the same thing? And that is why let's challenge ourselves. Let's follow Adam and Peter. Now you are Peter. I must say you did very well trying to mimic Peter last week. You did very well, brother. That's good. You see, let's follow these two preachers as we go through the book of the book of Acts and know what the early Christians, the way they saw the church, that someone have to sell everything that he had to get it. And that is how beautiful, how precious, and how important the church is. So this is where I'll leave you. Know your roots. Who are you?
Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And now for the final step in our Christian journey, when we will finally meet our Lord and Heavenly Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, face to face. Song number 853, when we all get to heaven. And that is based on 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to the end of the passage. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Let's stand as we sing this final. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll bring back for us a thing. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Traveling days are over, not a shadow nor a sign. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. serving every day just one glimpse of him in glory will the toss of life repay when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing Shall Let's pray. God and Heavenly Father, we thank for this time you've given us where we can gather together to worship you. We pray that the worship tonight was acceptable to you, Father, and we thank you for the message that was brought to us encouragement that we had tonight father and we pray that as we leave this place we are able to reflect on, on why we are here father and, and why we have decided to to mold our lives to to your word father we pray that you be with us throughout the week and you guide and protect us until we meet together again to worship you we pray these things in jesus name amen. amen father we come before you with with heavy hearts, Father, with these difficult news that we've heard. Father, we think of Cromwell and his family at this time, and the tragic news that they heard last week, and how difficult it would be to lose the head of a family, Father, to lose a preacher, Father, and a congregation. The work that he's been doing, striving to serve you, Father. The challenge that will bring to the family and to the congregation. Father, we pray for them. As how Cromwell affected their lives in different ways, Father. That you be a comfort to them. Be a comfort to the family, Father. Father, we thank you. Think of them as family at this time.
and it's difficult for her to lose to lose any, to lose anyone that we know. But to lose someone so young, father, it just makes it all the harder. Can't even begin to imagine what the family is going through at this time. But father, you made a promise to us that whatever difficult times arise, hardships, pain, suffering, that you, father, will provide a comfort that you, Father, will provide a peace. And Father, that's why we pray to you. What can we as mere human beings do, Father, without you? We pray to you, Father, to be a comfort to this family, to be a strength, Father. And Father, we not only just say these words, but we challenge ourselves as well. to be there for that family any way that we can. To show them, Father, that you are the God of true peace, the God of true comfort, who is there for them, who has never left them or departed them, Father. Let us be the ones to show them who you truly are, to show them the loving God that you are, because, Father, we need you more than ever now. And it serves as a, an example for us as well, Father. To look to you in these difficult times. Not to, not to look to ourselves. Not to look at what the world offers as a comfort, as a peace. But to you, Father. We also pray for the other person that, that Graham mentioned tonight, Father. Father, you know, you know them because you created them. And you know the difficult times that they're going through right now. Father, be with them also. Pray to be with us as a congregation as well. To grow in our relationships and our bonds and our unity that we have with each other. So that when difficult times arise, Father, we can build each other up, be that shoulder to cry on, be that bosom to rest our heads, Father. This is our prayer to you, to your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.